Hi, my name is Mike McMullen. I'm a pediatric heart surgeon at Seattle Children's Hospital in the University of Washington. And today we're here to discuss ECMO with my two esteemed colleagues. I'm Jay Swishenberger. I'm chair of surgery at University of Kentucky. My day job is a general thoracic surgeon, but most of you know me as Swish because I've done ECMO now for about 35 years. I've been involved in the ECMO community as we've organized and created our large international organization. Hi, my name is Sunil Prasad. I'm the uh, division chief at the University of Rochester, New York, uh, with adult cardiac surgery. So the, the growth of ECMO has been pretty remarkable over the last decade. And in fact, ECMO has grown about 300%. 7,000 people went on ECMO last year. And what's interesting is that initially ECMO was mostly for kids, but more recently over, over 50%, I think about 58% of ECMO patients are adults. So what do you think is uh, contributing to that? Well, I guess I'm the old guy in the group. So what I'll say is when I, I was Dr. Bartlett's first fellow back in the early 80s, and Dr. Bartlett was really the, the pioneer that took cardiopulmonary bypass technology, miniaturized it, and took it to the bedside of sick neonates that were dying of uh, persistent fetal circulation or meconium aspiration. That seemed to be the purest prep of a normal patient who developed life-threatening respiratory failure who could fully recover. That was his genius because when he applied it to that population, we saw a remarkably improved our outcome. As you know, in the early days, we were seeing 80% survival in patients that had formerly been only 20% survival. There were three prospective randomized studies that showed that to be efficacious. And then throughout the 80s and 90s and up to this day, ECMO is used in the neonatal population. What we didn't know then was we could continue to identify patient populations where respiratory failure was the primary driving factor for their illness. Then we discovered that at both cardiopulmonary support could be achieved with ECMO. And I think what you've seen is expansion from neonates, then children in the 90s and the early 2000s. And now in the mid-2000s, we've come to appreciate the fact that adults can benefit from ECMO. Really, nature gave us the experiment when in 2007 and 2008, H1N1, hit the adult population, was a terrible disease that couldn't be controlled with conventional management. And we resorted to ECMO sort of out of desperation, but it worked very well. There were numerous studies, numerous experiences that showed that it was efficacious. And then uh, once the adult population had been addressed and we'd broken the ice with the intensivist, it expanded to bridge to transplant, bridge to recovery, acute application in CPR, and where we are today. Yeah, it really was sort of an experiment, wasn't it? The, uh, I think there's really three things that, uh, that led to the growth of ECMO is, is the H1N1 experience and also um, newer technology, newer equipment, mm -hmm. and then the CSER trial that uh, came out about that time that showed that there was a benefit of either being treated with ECMO as an adult or being treated at an ECMO center. Actually, we learned a lot from the CSER trial. Uh, I, I see it as validating several aspects of critical care. First of all, what it showed us is a standardized treatment approach would better benefit patients instead of just however you feel that day or what your training told you to do 10 years ago. And that was set out in the, great, in the United Kingdom to where they standardized the care. The second thing it taught us was transporting a patient to a central ECMO center did have some risk. So you don't want to transport somebody without realizing there's about a 5% mortality just moving somebody that sick from one hospital to another. Then third thing it taught us was when you get to that major center, if you use standardized treatment approaches, about a third of the patients will get better anyway. They don't need ECMO. Mm -hmm. And then in that two thirds that need it, that's when it's really efficacious. So it was really uh, multifactorial in terms of teaching us how to manage a system. Yeah, and I think you've got a fair amount of experience with yeah, that. I have a, a little different experience because I came in the, uh, the age of the machines where I finished training in 2007. So my major uh, ECMO uh, thing is all VA ECMO. So you know, where we, I was at Barnes Jewish and I was the director of ECMO there, and where we learned is that patients with cardiogenic shock that went on VA ECMO towards LVADs. And so that was a, very different from the original where Dr. Bartlett had started with a, a, almost a respiratory failure. And we've, in the, at least in my short time uh, doing ECMO, we've done it to a cardiac failure. And so we've used ECMO as a bridge to decision 
for durable LVADs and transplants. We've transplanted patients off uh, of ECMO, had very good results, and we had tri uh, triage for LVAD patients that we knew that they're heart failure patients, and this is a very much of the Barnes experience, is there are patients that are out there, a population that the heart failure cardiologist was managing, they came in in cardiogenic shock, maybe they're home on Milleron, they weren't on anything, they came to the ER, we placed them on ECMO, and since they were in the system, we were able to fast track them to a durable VAD. Uh, and that's, I think, for from the cardiac side, I think it's been huge for us to allow us to triage patients to say, well, they have an appropriate socioeconomic background to support durable therapy, or they don't without implanting a durable VAD, which is a whole different cost and commitment level for the patient and their families. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I studied it, I have, don't have the, the breadth of uh, knowledge that you have from the, from the beginning, but in uh, my short time, it's been an incredible rise uh, of, of machines to help support decision making. And so, and I think the ease of use, you know, um, the ECMO circuits are much easier to use and the pumps are much easier to use and they require almost no maintenance. We, we have our nurses take care of them one to one. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think before there was perfusion models and so on. Yeah, that's really the future, I think. And uh, not only just the pumps, but also the cannula, right? The Avalon cannula was a pretty major advancement, right? Well, you, you introduced a, a topic that's very important, and that is a bridge to decision. Because we always thought for years that because of the cost and the commitment and the expense, and the, and the expense not only in money, but in human labor, we had to make a, d a decision that uh, dictated efficacy to where the patient would recover on ECMO. Uh, but with all the things you mentioned, uh, it's now capable that we can put somebody on ECMO to bridge them to a point to where we can make a decision on whether or not they should have a durable therapy or whether they should have a transplant or whether or not they're gonna recover from just ECMO support alone. Uh, the other concept that's entered into our thinking has been championed by Shaf Kashavsky and Chuck Hoops. And that is that we have a whole smorgasbord of applications of ECMO that range from arterial venous CO2 uh, support all the way to veno arterial support. And in between are various forms of partial uh, CO2 removal all the way to total CO2 removal to a total gas exchange. Now, Vino Venus ECMO early on struggled to get total gas exchange, but now that we've come up with new technologies to be able to separate the inflow and the outflow of blood pools, we can get total gas exchange on VV ECMO. And it's evolved to where using cannulas such as the Avalon, uh, we're able to get patients up and walk them around. So at University of Kentucky, we went from having patients flat on their back, intubated, sedated, arterial line, Foley catheter, it's invasive monitoring, lying there on, in the bed worrying about bed sores to where now we wake them up, extubate them, get them up, move them around. We've even evolved to where we have an exercise physiologist and we exercise them at the bedside. And by exercising the patients, we're able to make them a much better candidate either for recovery or for transparent recipient. I, I agree. I think that we were talking last night, the, uh, the advent of the next phase of ECMO, at least for the VA population, is, is ambulatory ECMO. I think that's, you know, as the, the, I think the community is starting to catch up on the advantages of standard ECMO, of using a, a life-saving therapy to create a bridge to decision or basically a suspended animation where they can get the patient to another center or get them to a, a LVAD heart center or a place that has more stable ECMO infrastructure to handle a long ECMO run. Uh, the next step is what you're doing is uh, already is you're you know, way ahead of the curve is ambulatory ECMO to recover these patients to have them spend the least amount of time on ECMO until they get a decision or recovery. But uh, well, how's, your, how's your pediatric experience? Uh, it's, it's quite good. Uh, they've, that's been uh, really the, the lion's share of experience over the years. Uh, we, we've probably hit a plateau a bit the, because the relative number of patients is decreasing compared to the adults. But uh, historically, the pediatric population has had better results than the adults. We, um, we have some kids that uh, will extubate on ECMO, but it's a little more challenging with kids just because of anatomic reasons. But it, it strikes me that we're really applying VV and maybe VA ECMO in the same way that durable VADs have been applied. Durable VADs are great because you get someone up and you re rehabilitate them. You get them ready for a transplant. You make them a, a better transplant candidate. And, uh, and really that's how ECMO is now being applied, mainly for the, the lung transplant patients. It's really pretty interesting. And one thing I'd like to talk about a bit is, um, is the availability of all these devices. With uh, some of the newer self-contained circuitry, just about any center in the world can be an ECMO center. And, and we know that if you look at the ELSO registry, 
the, the average number of ECMO patients per year in this country is about five per center, which is a really small number. And, and clearly there's some studies that show that, that survival is related to volume and experience. So what, what do you think about uh, the growth in the number of programs in addition to the number of patients in general? Well, I think we need to revisit what ELSO really is. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, I met with Dr. Bartlett, a bunch of us would get together and share experiences to try to figure out how to better our technology and better our, our patient management techniques. And it was, a, it was determined that we would have a voluntary organization where hospitals could join this club, Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, which we call ELSO. And throughout the United States, we have over 120 members and throughout the world it's caught on and it's really a, a club of critical care doctors dedicated to trying to save these critically ill patients in the neonatal children and adult populations, cardiac, respiratory support. So it's really broad in its, in its uh, application and its membership. The good news is everybody's there unselfishly and we voluntarily share our data. The bad news is it, it's difficult to do rigorous trials when you're voluntarily submitting your data. So well, it's been criticized for the fact it's voluntary, but it also encourages collegiality. And what we've learned is as a new technology catches on, or if something works in Europe, or if something works in Great Britain, or if something even works I over in Asia, all of us learn about it within about three months because we meet regularly, we communicate regularly, and with the internet, of course, people keep in touch almost daily. So I think it's been a, a tremendous tool for communication. What's been awkward is that we tend to be aligned by specialty. I'm a thoracic surgeon, you're a cardiac surgeon, there's pulmonologists, there's neonatologists, there's in pediatric intensivists, and all these groups tend to be fairly compact in terms of their membership and self-contained, and they tend to talk to each other in their own language. And having the uh, extracorporeal life support organization get together regularly and share data and share ideas has really been a language uh, Bear, uh, break in, it's broken the language barrier. It's allowed us to have the same language. It's allowed us to share ideas. And I think that's why during the H1N1, I lived through that. The calls came out from New Zealand and Australia that they had this weird virus that was killing adults. They just couldn't figure out what to do. And so uh, the cry went out worldwide, and that's when we suggested putting them on ECMO. And that's when the Avalon catheter first came out. They were putting these adults that they couldn't get off the ventilator on ECMO for really what was perceived as a fairly radical indication. And now you do it without hesitation. Mm -hmm. But that went viral worldwide within weeks. And how have you approached the, the regionalization of ECMO in your well, program? I'd like to hear how you set it up first, because you've been doing that a lot longer than I have. <laughs> well, I've set up two centers and helped set up dozens. Uh, but basically it boils down to serving your local population you have to do the training so that you make a decision whether you're going to address neonates, children, adults, respiratory, and cardiac, because that's the spectrum. And if you're going to do a full uh, menu, if you will, then you have to get your talent uh, organized and your protocols in place to where you're doing well at home. Then you have to arrange your transportation network. Are you, are you having these centers you set up to instill or put in ECMO and then transfer you for the, the chronic care component of it? Or are you going there to place ECMO and then bring the patients back? Well, we try to get patients to come before they need ECMO. <laughs> that makes it a lot easier. Uh, but we, if we need to, we go there and we put them on ECMO and then bring them back. Excellent. That's labor intensive. It's expensive. Uh, there's no real proven cost benefit to that way of doing it. So that's pushing it. And what, what geographic area are you talking about? Well, uh, we've flown as far as, as Georgia and uh, Texas, but we don't do that for fun. Uh, that, that's a big effort. It's expensive. And like I said, uh, what we prefer to do is use our ELSO community. And our philosophy is, is we always contact the closest center to wherever the phone call comes from okay. and try to see if they can be handled locally. Okay. And it's only if locally, um, what can happen is a major center even, even a couple hundred miles away, can become so busy that they can't handle that next patient. There's always limits to your resources. Uh, we've had it happen too. 
So if you get to where you can't handle that particular patient, then you call all your buddies within the network and you arrange transportation. Now, I agree with you, especially since we're doing more VA ECMO or patients that are in cardiogenic shock. I agree with you, education is probably the key, is trying to educate the regional centers of sending the patients earlier. But just, it, we've ran, run into struggles, you know, we're surrounded by almost 12 other hospitals and we've run into struggles about education because it's almost always too late and you don't want to say no, but by the time they come in, they're in multi-organ system failure and that window of cardio, cardiopulmonary support has, has gone out. And so uh, we are trying to look into where the local center will implement ECMO there with a simple two cannula system, whether it's VA or VV, and then send the patient. Because I think the transfer, again, as you're saying, you lose patients in transfer. Right. And I think the Caesar trial, as you pointed out, had, had seen that is at least you get them on something better than they are on. And they're not on 0.5 of Levo and 0.5 of Epi and mm -hmm. you know 0.08 of Vaso. At least they're on something reasonable during that 90-minute transfer. But it's a challenge. I think education is the key, and I think that's also is huge. You're absolutely yeah. right, and that's a really important point. As I've taken on more and more administrative responsibilities, I've come to realize that you have to have a system in place and, and trust within the communication. Because as you well know. A referral physician can always come up with a story good enough to get you to accept the patient. <laughs> and you have, within our also an ECMO community, we have to be straightforward with each other so we can make informed decisions on risk benefit. Because we're going to be accountable for risk benefit, cost, and outcomes, mm -hmm. and then quality, right? Right. And Absolutely. if you just base your decision on how desperate the person on the telephone is, you'll always make a bad decision. You have to, you have to weigh in all those other yeah. factors. Well, patient selection really determines the outcome in ECMO patients. And, and that really takes us back to the whole idea of a bridge to a bridge. You put someone on and then it gives you time. Because as expensive as it is, ECMO is still a lot less expensive than a durable VAD. Yeah. 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 And it's a lot less expensive than languishing in a critical care unit for days and weeks and months. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. I think one of the most important things to bring up is how our concept of critical care has changed. For the first two decades I did critical care, we thought we were big doctors, paralyzing a patient, intubating them, putting in a swung in catheter, an art line, Foley catheter, and having them lie there. And we'd made, ra we'd made, ra made rounds looking at a clipboard. And now we've come to appreciate that the human was designed to be a hunter-gatherer and mobile and be able to deep breathe and cough and have cir good circulation. And uh, getting patients up and moving them around has been a real game changer for us and I would encourage people to, to So do we've that. used the Avalon since we, I do more VA ECMO, putting the Avalon in through the uh, left subclavian vein and then putting a uh, arterial cannula sewn in through an eight millimeter graft to the subclavian artery so that we could even make VA patients because before we'd use femoral access and you can't right. get them up and walk right. but with the Avalon because it's such a great flow you can just Y both of them together and because it can, has that lower IVC cannula you'll at least drain some of the two-thirds coming from the bottom and so these are things that I think you guys are way ahead of and we've just started to do ambulatory but I think that's going to be the next generation I think that's where big centers like us as referral centers for ECMO people can put them on ECMO but will they have the physical therapist and you said you have an exercise physiologist I mean that's awesome and that's really where it's going is getting you know the mm -hmm. shortest time on ECMO but that's what you have to do. But I think so. what you say really underscores an important aspect of ECMO is really there's no single ECMO. ECMO is just a huge spectrum of therapies and, and there's different cannulation approaches, different uh, patient management approaches, different regional approaches and that's you know it's, that's why it's growing so much now is because there's so many different ways of doing it and everyone's trying to do it and come up with the best solution. All right. Well, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we've had a, a nice discussion about the growth of ECMO and some of the newer technologies and, and how we think it's going to be applied in the future.